I would like to ask the panelists to already come up here and uh, sit with us. So after now uh, almost a full, you know two half days of of um, of very interdisciplinary um, meeting, you know, c cross cutting topics from basic science to to um, to even policies, uh, we now also have a potpourri of um, of very eminent um, speakers with us. Um, representing some of the wide variety that we already have within the NRP. And I'll briefly introduce them to you, Tanya Sadler, I don't need to introduce, she just was up here. Isabella Eckele just arrived from Geneva by train, so I'll introduce uh, her. She's a virologist uh, from Geneva, has really worked hard also on microfluidic nanoimmunoassays in the past year, funded by the NRP 78 and also on risk assessment of evolving virus variants, similar to some of the work that Tanya, um, that, that, uh, Tanya did. And is also very, or is very active also on so social media. <laughs> and then we have Robert Rieben from University of Bern, who is the co-PI of a project in cardiovascular disease funded by the NRP78. He really is a basic, he's an immuno immunologist who spent all his career on um, studying innate immunity and endothelial function. So we now also have here a basic scientist. And lastly, uh, Christian Kallert, who is our clinician um, from the Canton Spital in St. Gallen, um, who did a, um, who was part of a longitudinal court study in healthcare workers. And I now will join you uh, here at the panel. And uh, so the way we're going to move forward is we'll have each of them sorry, present three to five minutes of their current work and with Tanya, maybe just one minute because we've already heard you. And then we, and after each uh, short talk, you can have specific questions. And after that, we'll have more cross-cutting questions. And this, this is meant to be interactive and you can guide and shape this whole discussion. So over to Isabella Eckerle, who, who came last and should be first. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for being here. Unfortunately, I missed the day yesterday. Um, yeah, so uh, what I am basically doing, I, I used to work on coronaviruses uh, also before the pandemic. And when the pandemic came, we had a national reference laboratory for emerging viruses in Geneva. So we quickly um, well, set up all the tools that were necessary. And then over the time started to implement diagnostics, um, also to de detect variants or monitoring tools. And um, my main uh, project that is funded by the SNF is on establishing a biobank of um, uh, virus isolates, clinical isolates that we generate in our outpatient testing center that we then characterize genomically, that we grow in the lab and perform some kind of phenotypic assessment for growth on different cell lines, neutralization assays, how well diagnostics still work with them. So this is one large part. We also have the opportunity to call back people who were infected with a certain variants to draw blood. And that feeds into several um, other projects and collaborations. We also also have one project that we're doing together with Volker Thiel and the one um, with the EPFL with Sebastian Merkel where we established a novel essay that can be used to perform large-scale um, uh, seroprevalence studies or also do um, sero, um, sero studies, studies of um, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies with very low amounts of blood that we have also used in a, um, in a study on children that I think was presented yesterday by ELSA. So, yeah, and that is the main work that we did funded under these three projects. Thank you, that was shorter than three minutes. <laughs> so so um, maybe I'll start a question. Um, did, you, did you listen to Tanya's talk? So yes. do you, in, so in, in essence, do you, what, what, there was a question from somewhere here. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with the idea that it's more likely that the next variants would be less severe? So there would be a linear evolution to, to, mm. to, or do you think there's a high chance also of recombination and that we need to be prepared also for a more severe? I think severe? at the moment we can't tell. So what is maybe important to understand that these variants, they did not evolve from each other. So it's not like with flu that the virus that you have now is an ancestor of what was circulating before. But what we have seen so far um, is that all the variants go back to an ancestral virus of 2020. So they are not evolving from each other. And that means that if there is a new variant, it could also mean that they come from an whatever unknown pool of virus circulation. So it's also important to know that we still don't know where these um, variants come from. So we really don't understand 
where they really evolve or where they are, because they, they were somewhere and then they were popping up and apparently we have missed them in all the time with all the genomic surveillance. And I think it's, like Tanya explained, for the virus it's not very crucial that um, the host gets sick or does not get sick. So this virus is already very good because it transmits before people get sick, it transmits asymptomatically. So for the virus it, it doesn't matter. So I think it's just a some, I don't know, coincidence if the virus makes us more sick or less sick. And it could be that after Omicron, there will be something else that might make people more sick. Now, this is the virus side. On the other hand, um, a lot of us or almost everyone has been in contact, has been vaccinated. So that even there, if, if there's a new variant, we do, it is not coming into an immune naive population. So we also have something to offer, I would say, even if there's a variant that is more severe. But what we have seen also in the hospital, that this whole situation is really very dynamic. So there is still this question, how well will the rapid tests work, either because we are vaccinated or because the variants change. We have seen that there was a lot of development of monoclonal antibodies, but for example, with Omicron, we have lost all of them except one. With BA1, we have even lost this last one. There are new ones coming up, but it means that this whole situation is very fragile, I would say, in terms of, of, um, of understanding where these variants come from, but also in terms then what we do in terms of public health measures, but also, um, for example, for treatment of patients. And I think that this will go on for a while. So we, we really need to uh, have the knowledge on these variants and, um, um, and, and better understand what happens with this virus. So we are not in a stable situation where we can say, well, now we know how everything works, we have all the tools and we can relax. Any questions? Yeah, we, we do. I can yeah. speak loud. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. We, 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 we do have actually uh, an, uh, a pretty naive um, population, which is China. Yeah. I, I don't know if you agree with no, me. No, I was but speaking it, about Switzerland it, now. But yeah. yeah, how do you see the prospect there? I mean, mm. is it um, going to be really severe for them? Should they really mm. start a, a, a um, mm. vaccination program on the large scale now? Or mm. what, what's your view on that? So I think, first of all, China is interesting because everyone says Omicron is so mild. That's why we can go back to our normal life. And actually, when you look to China, you see that Omicron is not that mild. And apparently, the problem is that a lot of the uh, elderly population is not vaccinated and those people that are vaccinated are vaccinated with a vaccine that is not um, very effective. And I think it's also a, a scenario that, that could have happened here. So I think sometimes when I look to China, I think we, we don't even recognize how lucky we, we were with everything that we have. And um, so, so I'm not an expert on China or on, on what they are doing there. But for example, I saw some data that um, with even one mRNA vaccine, they could actually boost the existing vaccine response from the other vaccine very well. So at some point the question is when do you just use the tools that are there? So this is not a scientific question I guess but more a political question. But um, obviously I mean there is not a sustainable strategy in having these lockdowns because the virus will stay and, and we see that Omicron is so contagious so it's it's not possible to contain this virus for the long term. So I think they, I mean, either you vaccinate or you will have a, a huge crisis again, which after now almost uh, three years, of course, is, I mean, yeah, they are the tools, so you, you have to use them. Yeah. Would anyone with experience in China want to speak up? I also don't know, for example, if the, why, why or if they don't have their own um, mRNA vaccines or if they have any vaccine technologies that work better, so I don't know. Um. I volunteer to speak up for China. <laughs> <laughs> so China, China does have actually a quite high vaccine coverage rate, mm. and the inactivated vaccines um, uh, did have a lower efficacy results in the phase three trials where, where the endpoint was any symptomatic disease. But the same vaccine was also used in Chile, and they did publish vaccine effectiveness studies post-introduction, and in fact, the, 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 the vaccine effectiveness against severe disease is almost equal to mm -hmm. the mRNA. So we should not downplay the role of inactivated vaccines. Um, they, they have, they're less effective against infection and mild disease, but they are, as Johnson Johnson, as the others, relatively on a high level against severe disease. 
And the only problem in China is that indeed they have a relatively low uh, coverage amongst the very old. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what they now need to do. And I hope once they have achieved, they've caught up with that, that they will then open because, lo because zero COVID is, not, as you said, not mm. a long not, not a long term solution. Any, anyone who wants to add on the China situation? But you're also right that we are looking at Omicron at a situation where we all basically all have either vaccination or infection-induced immunity. And this is different to China and Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, we did, did see a very high death rate uh, with, with, mm. with Omicron. All right. Um, any more issues? Uh, so we hand over to to um, to Tanya. But Tanya, you because it's still within the same the same topic. You mm -hmm. will give you a little bit less time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be very brief since I pretty much um, explained what we did scientifically during the um, COVID pandemic. And then just to make clear, so our group is not uh, compared to Isabella's. We are not um, experts in coronaviruses in a sense that we worked um, the whole time already on coronaviruses. Our expertise is actually on um, evolutionary biology generally, and in particular using genomic data to understand evolution. So we, for example, also did a lot on species evolution, so evolution on millions of years, and then fast evolution, say we did before influenza a lot, which is a pathogen as well, but on detailed and many different things. But so this is kind of what the joint theme in our lab is, using genomic sequencing data and reconstructing evolutionary history and understanding evolutionary patterns. And that's when we then, in early 2020, um, made the decision that we try to help understand <coughs> SARS-CoV-2 evolution. Thank you. Any, any comments or questions? Yes. We heard a lot about surveillance in humans. I was wondering how do you integrate surveillance in wild and, and uh, agriculturally used animals? And there's a, there were a lot of reports now on white deer in the US infected. Do you think this is really a pool that might come back at us or is this just a dead end and we, we're not going to have any trouble with these viruses? So um, in Indeed, um, and we made this point also to FOPH that we think one should survey also in Switzerland better other um, um, reservoirs where this virus could ha hide, so to speak. And I think definitely we cannot exclude that it's not jumping back to us. How high the risk is at any moment and what those variants would be is a different question. But I think there is again um, surveying very well the interface um, wildlife and humans uh, is an important aspect. Um, actually in our lab we have one um, project where it's um, not even agricultural um, life but um, domesticated animals, so cats, dogs, people um, um, who have uh, pets and were corona positive also could um, have in certain studies their um, pets tested and we sequenced the viruses and actually um, we found that normally it was then assumed epidemiologically if the owner and the animal are both uh, corona positive. It's probably a within household transmission and we saw this winter that say the owner had Delta and the cat had Omicron. So <laughs> revealing that actually there's so much virus circulation and the animals definitely also must get it from outside the household. That doesn't show if it's cat to cat or human to cat, but I think it's very important that we have this on the radar. It's also Omicron, we don't know if it was from animals or in some immunocompromised patients. You mentioned before that it would be very important to combine the clinical data together with your genomics data and even more there are some uh, models based on, on CT scans. There are so many uh, projects who, which would have a great benefit from a large common database in Switzerland to pool all the, the multimodal data to a common database in Switzerland. Do you know whether there is an initiative for that? That's a very timely question. So actually yesterday, the government, there was a proposal, um, I think by Ruth Humbe, um, from parliament towards the government saying we need to more efficiently use data which is collected for whatever reason on the more administration level in research. And now Pamela's department has the request to, to make a concrete proposal how this is being done. And there, in fact, um, 
we were asked earlier to just comment on um, in this initial thing the government had to decide where were the limitations from our perspective in the pandemic. And um, a lot were on the legal side, say, getting together who is vaccinated and who tests positive. Those two databases, apparently there's a legal problem because one is federal and one is um, cantonal and you can't put them together, which, well, we all have to respect the law, etc. But I guess we have to have some discussions at what point, if it's anonymized enough, can we actually change their legal um, a legal basis? So yes, it's now in Pamela's department. Um, the timeline is that in 2023, they have to come up with some um, proposal. We were discussing earlier, we hope, or uh, I think we should try to be active from the academic side to bring in also our perspectives that actually it's understood in Bern what would help us as a research community and find a legal framework that this is happening. Maybe I can also comment on that from, from like the hospital point of view, that this is also not very easy to collect these data. So especially if you do not have the testing center on site and especially if you want to have a follow-up. So in the end, you need either a system who really captures this data or you need a study nurse. But sometimes um, it doesn't work just by itself that the data are generated and then the data are generated in a different way, in different hospitals, there are different definitions, there are also legal aspects, so do you have to get um, informed consent from that patient or how, uh, I think I, I, we have heard a lot of this that there is really a problem with uh, linking these databases even within um, the BRG that they are not able to link their databases as they like which of course is a good thing because there are laws to, for data protection but I think the, the different way how, how um, data are collected, whether it's CT values, whether it's clinical outcome, whether it's vaccination, it's, it's not very standardized and each place does it differently and it's not very easy to do that and then also to use them further. Mm -hmm. So I think there are still a lot of like legal and, and organizational obstacles to, to get that. We need to move on. Last question, yeah. short not sure if short, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe going back to surveillance. I mean, um, um, one thing is to detect, you know, all the mutations, but the other thing is to know what they mean. And I think we have learned a lot about the spike uh, in terms of immune evasion, transmission, but uh, all the mutation outside spike. And if we if we think about, you know, um, informing politicians, decision makers about a, a risk that is there or not and um, how are we prepared for instance for you know when antivirals are used and we see um, resistance emerging and uh, this may also come at a low incidence in, in the beginning and then we may miss it. Mm -hmm. I agree and I think um, there um, I guess what you refer to is then if we do their proper surveillance also the actual virus should be investigated further in the um, virology labs and we have also a problem there at the moment that even if we get all the surveillance with respect to say sequencing up to speed and do that timely it is that often we got requests we saw I don't know, say Omicron um, and people want to have the virus, you or Isabella or others. The problem being um, the diagnostic labs, there is from the Federation um, a rule, I understand, I think seven days you have to keep samples and we only get the RNA extract. So um, things might have been thrown away by the time we actually know it's interesting. And I think this whole pipeline beyond SARS-CoV-2 should be thought through what do we need to store how long. Um, and I mean, yes, of course, it costs some money to store certain things. Um, Others are the experts there, but it's also not in comparison to being quick, um, not, uh, you can save a lot of um, money. And I feel generally, and that also came up in the last question on kind of data and connecting data sets, etc. Switzerland, despite um, being, I would claim, very good uh, at the forefront in research, being definitely a very rich country. We relied pretty much on Israel, on the UK and South Africa to provide us um, data and they all have um, well um, easier ways to connect data and also workflows established some be before the pandemic to actually exchange the relevant material slash information. Thank you. So now let's move and hone into the endothelium. And so we have here an immunologist with us, and uh, really the endothelial is systemic and, and understanding its role 
and the interaction with, with COVID is very important. Well, thank you very much, uh, Annelies. Um, when, when I saw the first pictures uh, of people with vascular consequences of SARS-CoV-2 <coughs> infection, that immediately reminded me of pictures I've seen before working on xenotransplantation, working on allotransplantation, working on ischemia reperfusion injury. It looks very similar. You have skin lesions because of no flow, because of coagulation. And you have a typical picture of a microvascular thrombosis. So what does that mean? I, I would like to, to take you into, um, with me on a journey into the blood vessel, as you just mentioned. <laughs> So the, the blood vessels are on the inner side covered by endothelial cells. So that is the cell which makes direct contact with our blood. And it's also our natural anticoagulant because we are not heparinized like a patient would be or when you use uh, external circulation. So the endothelial cells do that by expressing anticoagulant, anti-inflammatory proteins, but mostly also by expressing an icing on the cake, a sugar layer, heparin sulfate proteoglycans, which scavenge proteins from the plasma, which helps them then to be anticoagulant, anti-inflammatory, and pro-fibrinolytic. And that's the natural steady state of the endothelium. A healthy endothelium is like that. Now, if you trigger the endothelial cells, they become pro-coagulant, pro-inflammatory, and anti-fibrinolytic. And then, of course, when we saw these pictures, um, not only me, but also three colleagues of mine, Britta Engelhardt working on neuroinflammation, Yvonne Döring working on vascular inflammation in, in the periphery, and Nadia Mercader working on cardiac development, cardiovascular development. We teamed up and we submitted uh, an application which is, is, is now funded and we are nicely working together on the theme of uh, what happens to, to the vasculature, what are the vascular consequences of SARS-CoV-2. And then, of course, the first idea, not only of us, but of many other people, was, well, endothelial cells probably get infected. So there is virus reproduction in the endothelium. And that also came from the fact that when you do an electron micrograph of patient samples, patient tissue samples, you actually see virus in the vessel wall. But then, in vitro, not only us, but also all the others who tried it could not infect endothelial cells. So the question arises, well, what is going on here? Why do we have these vascular consequences, but the virus somehow does not infect these cells? And there is now two things which come into play. One is that the vessel does not only consist of the endothelial cells on the inner side, but around the endothelium in the, in the capillaries, we have the so-called pericytes. And pericytes, in contrast to endothelial cells, they express ACE2, which is a known receptor or co-receptor for uh, SARS-CoV-2. They can be infected, and they will have an influence on uh, vasoconstriction or vasodilation in the periphery, in, in the capillaries. And that can have a, a really waste, a vast influence on how well a tissue is perfused or not perfused. And I think that's one thing we're, we're going to, to work on, of course. And the other thing was that, that there's a paper which just appeared very recently, that if you expose endothelial cells to just spike protein, they become activated. And that is, of course, something which could circulate in the blood or could come from, from the, the uh, basolateral side of the blood vessels into the endothelium and then activate the endothelium cells. So I think you want to make the, the, the link then also to long COVID. And of course there the, the, the question was always, well, could it be that vascular consequences are causing uh, the long COVID uh, symptoms? And uh, there is some reports on, on coagulation, on microthrombosis, etc. In my view, that would be very tricky. You know, if you have a, a thrombosis going on and, and uh, just continuing and it's not resolved in the brain, for example, 
then you're dead within rather short time. So I don't think that uh, really a, a pro-thrombotic situation would cause long, really long COVID over, over months. But what could be is that it's, it's the function of the pericytes which is no longer as it should be. Some people have called that a pericyte disarray, which means that they are no longer functioning properly and that could lead to, to a intermittent uh, malnutrition of the tissue or, or uh, loss of, of an adequate blood supply to, to tissue, also in the brain. And I think that that is something which we need to look into uh, if we want to understand long COVID. Thank you. Um, whole range, a very deep topic, very important for all our understanding, also for, for therapeutics and interventions. Any questions? Uh, thanks a lot. It was very interesting. I was wondering, you, you mentioned that the spike protein can activate these endothelial cells, but what about the spike protein that is produced when we get the vaccine? Does it also have this potential um, to be potentially dangerous for in this case? I haven't seen reports on that. So the, the, what I was referring to was a paper which was purely in vitro. And uh, I think you, you, we first would have to assess how much spike protein you actually get in the blood circulation if you have a vaccination, whether, whether it can be found at all. Maybe some people here know, I don't know. So I'm, I'm not aware of that. <coughs> it could be one of the side effects, of the rare side effects we see, especially when, when people really train very hard uh, just after the immunization, and that could cause then more vascular effects. So something to be investigated, but I have no answer. Same question? Um, down here, other side. No, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I was wondering, like, what is the turnover of these cells? So, so, because some patients now have, I don't know, several months at least long COVID. So, do you think that stem cells are in, involved in the whole process? Is this something that stays within the vessel with some kind of imprinting? Okay, I could say something about the endothelial cells. They are, they are replaced at a rather low rate. If there is no injury, if the endothelium is injured, then you have endothelial progenitor cells, which then replace the endothelium. So you, are, you also have a re-endothelialization. I'm, I'm, I must say that I'm just ignorant about uh, how quickly pericytes uh, are, are turned over. So that, but that's certainly something to, to look into. And whether, whether just replacing the uh, pericytes would be enough or whether you also, you know, it could also be that we start to have an immune response against these pericytes and that then innate immunity or even adaptive immunity, sort of autoimmune phenomena, um, could be part of the problem which you have. Another question here. Yeah, thanks for the very nice explanation. Do you observe any gender difference for such kind of endocellular cells or pericytes effect? Well, I'm not a clinician, so I'm not seeing patients. And um, so far, we don't have a lot of different types of endothelial cells we're looking into. Even, you know, many people still use so-called UVEX, human umbilical vein endothelial cells and usually they don't know the gender or the sex of these cells. Uh, so I cannot answer this question, but what I could say more in general is that it will certainly differ um, if you have endothelial cells from an aorta as compared to microvascular endothelial cells from the kidney as compared to lung microvascular endothelial cells. And, and we, we still don't really understand the differences of, of uh, biology of these endothelial cells. And we first need to understand the biology in order to be able to understand the pathobiology then of these endothelial cells. So gender differences, sex differences could play a role. Even the expression then of blood group antigens could play a role there. 
because the blood group antigens in vivo are expressed on endothelial cells. So, for example, blood group A, it's clearly if you, if you are a blood group A person, then you will have your endothelium full of that. So that could really play a role. But if you go in vitro and you do st standard cell culture, it's not there anymore. So that's then in vitro artifacts which, which need also to be considered. Initially, there were also some data that there's a higher risk for those with a blood group A compared to zero. So that would corroborate what you just said. Yeah, that's why I said it. I mean, these, uh, I think these data are still around. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether they were verified with larger populations, blood group differences and susceptibility to infection or severity. I haven't read a lot of follow-up on that, so... At least nothing that entered in the clinical in terms of it fiddled out somehow yeah, this whole initial yeah, yeah. hype on the on the blood groups. Yeah. But did you did you consider the blood groups uh, when you do your uh, analysis? So we um, for clinical studies, I'm not aware that it's done. Okay. No. Talking about long COVID, I have some experience in the in the lung because I'm um, a chest radiologist. So um, the concern was that it would be a progressive disease that we see in long COVID, but it turns out it's it's rather not. So we see the changes, but they stay there; they don't get worse. Sometimes they get much better. Sometimes they just stay there for for month and month and month. Have you seen that with um, in in the vasculature a progressive disease, or what's your experience? Or is it is it there and it stays like it is, or what, what's the time course? No, we, we we yet have to perform such experiments in animal models that will be part of the study of uh, Yvonne Döring uh, working with mice then when we can really assess that. I think with in vitro experiments with endothelial cells, you're, that's just not the right tool for that. Then we would really have to look into either animal models or in a clinical situation. But I think for the patients, it's of course good if you don't have a lot of lung fibrosis and then really chronic problems leading to, to dysfunction. I mean, from clinical observational studies, there's a clearly a risk up to 12 months reported, right, of increased odds for having a stroke, heart, heart attack, etc. So, so it is it is something to take really seriously. So let's move from this idea that there's a parasite disarray to uh, now uh, the clinician um, uh, looking into long COVID in healthcare workers. So over to you, Christian. Thank you. Yes, yesterday I introduced some of you already in our longitudinal healthcare worker study and we today I want to share with you some of the results with regard to long COVID. Um, the study is more than 5,000 participants, healthcare workers from more than two, uh, 23 healthcare institutions and what we were looking at was um, the f weekly symptoms and we assessed also uh, scores on anxiety, depression, uh, cognitive impairment, and fatigue. <coughs> the results uh, from this study are based on uh, more than 3,000 healthcare workers, and we stratified them into those that reported nasopharyngeal swab positivity, and those that were tested anti-N, antibody ne uh, positive, and those that were neither an NPS positive or antibody positive. So we have three groups. And if it comes to the symptoms after for the, for the, the frequency of symptoms in, in, in these uh, three groups, we see that the, those that were NPS positive, so reported active disease, had much more symptoms um, uh, compared to the negative uh, group we um, had, had about 70% of the whole population that reported an NPS positive result compared to 7% uh, with only anti, uh, N antibody positivity. But, but if you compare the groups that were negative with those that were, had only antibodies, there was no difference. So um, we expect that results a little bit because um, if you only have antibodies and never um, experience disease, uh, then maybe those reflect the uh, asymptomatic cases uh, in, in our population. What was, in, what was interesting with regard to risks 
um, was that, um, and this is maybe alluding a little bit to the question that was before with regard to gender, um, we, ha we had um, a higher um, risk for female, for younger female um, in this population. And that was clearly um, visible. We had an elevated risk with higher um, uh, BMI, so weight is, is important. And we had also a higher risk for those that reported taking medication or having co, uh, uh, comorbidities. And one point that was um, interesting was that if you look at the fatigue scale, for example, um, the, those that uh, were infected had had uh, fatigue um, score above 36, that is considered as, as a relevant uh, result, was in about uh, one, one in five. But in the control group, and also in those that only had antibodies, uh, there were also one in 10 had, had uh, fatigue score uh, 36 or higher. And for, with regard to protective uh, th uh, things, um, it, it turned out that if you are physically active, you have much more, uh, much less uh, um, risk to, to have a fatigue score uh, with 36 and also for the score that relates to the cognitive impairment. So that was one protective, seems, could be a protective uh, thing. And just asking immediately for clarity, it is, it is physical activity as a part of your baseline um, life, lifestyle yes, or yes. physical activity <laughs> during disease? But it, it was asked repetitively, the physic, phys, physical activity over the time. So we started in the uh, midst of 2020. So even more reason to be physically active. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any questions? Yeah. Yes, um, I just have one question. Um, Maybe with the microphones? Yeah, no. everybody can. Yeah, uh, the question is about um, your data. Uh, so it's some self-reported data from the health workers, or you did objective yeah, yes, assess? Yes, the nasal pharyngeal swabs, yes. Mm -hmm. But as they were healthcare workers within the hospitals, we validated the results also uh, with the, with the uh, results in within the hospitals. Yeah, because we have the study on the brain and the facts on the brain and the cognition, and we see a group of patients who has really discrepancies between self-reported symptoms and objectively assessed symptoms. It's a group of anosognosic patients, and for cognition, for fatigue, they report that they do not have nothing. They have a really good quality of life, everything is fine, but when we assess objectively the cognition, we observe that these patients have much more um, uh, memory deficits, much more executive deficits, and also for fatigue, we are actually... Um, Working on it, we have some objective measure of cognitive fatigue. We observe that between the groups, they're not objectively uh, different levels of fatigue, but our group reports much more of self-reported fatigue and the other one significantly less. That. What could you say about maybe these limits of self-reporting for this yes. kind of study? Maybe this effect of the virus or indirect on the consciousness, because we also have effects on MRI where we show that maybe the um, networks involved on self-consciousness and bodily signals could be affected. And maybe that we could go, we could not in clinical practice maybe see these patients because they won't come to us. We took them because we selected all the patients that we could find in the hospital, but this patient hadn't com had not complaints. But actually, they maybe suffer from long COVID. In the long term, maybe we will see them with more deficits that will be reported by their person around. What could you, did you also observe this Patterns or so I think what you, what, what you mean is really a limitation, uh, the self-reporting of the results. However, we have uh, the scores that are, we, we are using are validated um, and uh, frequent use and also use in all, all the departments that are following patients with long COVID. Um, it is clear also that our population is, is a little bit selected because they uh, decided to participate in the study. So um, they, they, they are more interested uh, probably um, in, in knowing about uh, their, their health. So that, that, that is a limitation. I, I don't really have an answer how to overcome that because it's a limitation in itself. But the 
the results uh, all over i think uh, they 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 uh, really uh, fit with with what we see in the in the clinics I have a question, and were these results all from um, people who got infected before the vaccination, or do you also have people who were infected afterwards who report such yes. phenomena? So we have in, in our population, um, in the negative group, we have about uh, half of them were uh, vaccinated already, um, and in, in the, those that were infected, only 13% were, were vaccinated, but it was not stati stati mm -hmm. statistically significant, the difference. Mm -hmm. So we cannot say uh, really uh, if, if there's a difference or not. Okay. But, but there is obviously uh, data already uh, mm -hmm. that, that vac vaccination helps also against yeah. long COVID reduction, 40 to 50 percent. So I think that's a very important thing. Mm -hmm. And we, we would uh, again analyze uh, our population um, in, in, in a few months and um, validate uh, mm -hmm. the, these results. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the interesting insights. I have two questions. Does your data allow you to draw uh, associated symptoms together? Are there clusters of patients, <coughs> like some, those that have fatigue have more cognitive difficulties or things like that? And do you have any data about the acute infection? Can you draw parallels between uh, how the acute infection was and what type of symptoms they have longitudinally? Mm -hmm. So the, um, the f for the first questions, we have all this data, but uh, this was not analyzed yet here for that. And uh, for the uh, acute infection, we have uh, information because we followed weekly all the symptoms. And uh, we know that um, uh, when, when we were assessing uh, the, our patient, uh, our participants uh, with, 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 the, with the scores um, uh, questionnaires, um, the acute infection was uh, in median about 100 days uh, pr uh, before. So we... We, but we don't see uh, clusters of, of uh, uh, special um, symptoms, for example, limp muscle pain or, or a taste smell impairment. Um, they, we, we only see that if you have more symptoms, you are more likely to, to, to have uh, long COVID. And we also assessed antibody uh, levels, and there we again see a correlation between higher antibody levels and reporting more symptoms. I have one question also. <laughs> you know, the, we still do not fully understand the true incidence of long COVID, and it may also differ by, by variance. And the problem is that we still don't have a good definition, and that we often, many studies, do not have a good control group. Um, but anyway, so what is your understanding of Omicron now? Uh, because now we've had more than three months, we probably will get an idea about, about the incidence. And from hearsay, we all think it's less, but do you have any more data or any other knowledge? That will be also part of the, our next analysis because the, it, it is not covered in, in this study or uh, Omicron. But uh, what we see in clinics is exactly that uh, it seems to be a little bit less, but it's too, too early. probably too early because the symptoms yeah, will, will continue for at least six months and, and more. And to come back to our immunologists, do you think long COVID is mainly due uh, as an autoimmune phenomenon or a persistent of a virus in some latent reservoirs in the body or an ongoing mild endotheliitis? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you know, uh, I don't like to do guesswork uh, on stage. Um, <laughs> I think... Um, the, the uh, viral reservoir, I, I don't believe into that. I think we would have found that already. And, and uh, as far as I know, there is no indication uh, for that, not, not within our body. So what we know from, from similar sy symptoms um, is that there is an autoimmune component in that. So not, not now particularly long COVID, but chronic fatigue syndrome. D their autoimmune uh, at least participation has been reported, and I think that is something uh, where, where we should look into. Chronic endothelialitis, uh, that is then uh, a consequence of this ongoing 
low level probably immune attack. That would be my well still guessing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think in the future our our conferences will mainly co focus now on, on, lo on long COVID. Once the acute uh, phase of the pandemic is over, we'll have to deal with with long COVID. So uh, we have five minutes left. And the five, in the final five minutes, I thought I'll ask one question at two, the same question to each of the of the panelists, and see what your response is. And there is, and the question is now bigger: <laughs> how how did the NRP 78 help in um, in fostering a pandemic research and pandemic research capacity? And what are the lessons learned from this NRP 78? And I'll start with Tanya. Sure, thank you. Um, I would say what went really well is that um, the Swiss Science Foundation, both I would say with the NRP, but also the special call for coronaviruses, was very quick in aiming to help researchers who um, have the capacity, either they are experts on coronaviruses or in some have related um, expertise to contribute to um, the pandemic response to have quickly access to funds. Since in reality, I think most here in January switched with some other research money on coronaviruses and so it allowed people to actually get money to do this work. I think what was... Um, there are two things um, um, I would like to further comment on. A missed opportunity, I think, was more generally that we don't have a big cohort in Switzerland. We have a HIV cohort, which is amazing, and an international standard is really a prime example. There were pushes, but somehow it never got into practice that we have a big cohort, and now it's more on um, amazing but kind of local studies, what we heard yesterday also from Geneva. And the other thing is, obviously, it's not over. Long COVID will be a huge topic, so once now the special calls and the NRP runs out, um, I guess it's important to think about how to um, maintain uh, research in those areas. Thank you, Tanya. To um, Robert? <laughs> Well, the NFP was, was absolutely helpful to, to bring the, the four research groups which are now in our project together and to start up things. So it was, was very good to lay a basics, but it's too short now. So if, because this will end now after two years, it's really too short for us to, to have good data and, and really also helpful data um, within the framework of, of this NFP. And for us then the problem will arise, okay, what are we doing? Are we just turning uh, our normal NFP pro uh, SNF projects into COVID projects? Um, but we also want to continue, of course, our normal line of research. Uh, or do we just drop that and then that, that was it? And I think that would be very sad. So I think it would be really helpful if there was some sort of a, a continuation so that also the basic understanding of these mechanisms, and I think especially concerning long COVID, we just don't know anything, you know. Uh, we need some more basic understanding there, and, and we now have a lot of tools which uh, were successfully established with, with this project, but we should be able to move on. Thank you, Christian. For our uh, research, it was extremely important because we already started before with the healthcare worker court, but only locally, and had the possibility to enlarge it to uh, healthcare facilities all over the eastern part of Switzerland um, and also in the Zurich um, region. Um, and we, I think, had some uh, interesting results already, but we will go for further on also with the longitudinal cohort uh, within healthcare workers also addressing other questions because we have many questions besides coronavirus in healthcare workers. Um, uh, for example, influenza is an important topic, um, vaccination issues, um, also antimicrobial um, susceptibilities. Um, so we have many questions uh, that we are now able to uh, address. Thank you, Isabella. 
Yeah, I think the, the three programs in the end, they were extremely helpful. Um, I mean, I have seen this for us. We have had this um, like um, reference laboratory for the BAG that has then really allowed to, um, to, uh, to help with the genomic surveillance, to help with the research projects. And um, I also, also to what Volker uh, mentioned earlier on, many times in the beginning I had this experience that we were told that genomic sequencing or studying children is only an academic interest and does not have public health um, uh, relevance um, from like official sites and I think this is also something that should be taken into account that a lot of the work that we do with our research in the end has some practical implications but has to be done under the roof of a research project and I think it needs to have more connection of the usefulness of this research especially in an, uh, in an outbreak and, and what I always feel that Switzerland is so small and the science is so good that there is really a lot of opportunity to, to, have, um, to have data in a very high resolution in a very high quality and I think this is an opportunity that probably not a lot of countries have um, because the country is just so small, so well connected. Um, we have seen this when we, when, when we want to share isolates, when we want to, want to share specimens. With outside it's very difficult but within Switzerland it's very easy because the country is so small and I think to have this connectedness and also have this new collaboration set up um, has really fueled the, the research definitely for me but I also agree that um, two years is very short so for example it was not possible to hire a PhD student so the question is a bit how do we train the next generation of scientists that probably also have to deal with such outbreaks more often and with these interdisciplinary questions of clinicians um, molecular studies bioinformatics uh, lab-based virology or lab-based science working together and I think this is something that somehow needs to be addressed that not only have this short-term funding and then jump on something else because in a few years nobody will be interested in COVID anymore. Well, thank you. And we are really thanks to NRP78. It's for that reason that we are here. Um, and we've, had, we've listened to a lot of excellent research output thanks to the NRP78 funding. And of course, uh, lots of lessons to be learned. But um, on this note, I would like to thank the panelists and um, also the audience for interesting questions and for interesting comments from the panelists and a big clap to the panelists.